All right, everybody, good evening. We are meeting with Joe Amron, and Joe is the owner of Pierogi Gallery in Brooklyn, which is kind of different, I think, than most galleries and, and special in some ways. And I think it's because Joe is special, too. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? How are you doing, Paul? Excellent. Hi, um, how long have you been involved in the art world? Well, and I went to school in Sacramento, California, and I really got started there when I was in high school and I uh, got involved in, uh, basically when I was uh, listening to a lot of music and getting involved in the album covers and uh, interested in that sort of uh, aesthetic and uh, got more serious uh, when I moved to San Francisco and started showing my work in, uh, in the late 70s. So you grew up in Northern California? Grew up in Sacramento and uh, left there when I was about uh, 28 or so and moved to San Francisco to L.A. and then ended up in New York. Did you think, you, you, you are, besides being an art dealer, you are an artist too, right? You still make art, don't you? I still make work, yes, of course. And uh, I have to do that. This is part of uh, my psyche. I just have to produce, uh, investigate ideas and develop. And I treat the gallery in a similar way, I think. It's, uh, Pushing ideas that uh, aren't really uh, plausible with the normal uh, commercial space. Can I, I want to get to that in a minute? But um, did you think you were going to be an artist when you were ch a kid? I uh, was always encouraged when I was a kid. Yes, I'd always be working and developing things, investigating, and uh, people were very encouraging when I was working and uh, drawing a lot and. Uh, and it wasn't so much until I went to high school where I met uh, Gary Pruner and Joe Patitucci, some great teachers of mine in high school, and they were very encouraging, and they turned me on to a lot of uh, interesting work and uh, artists, and uh, really turned my head around, and I really went from there. Where did you go to college? I went to uh, college, uh, junior college, American River College in Sacramento, and then... Um, by the time I got out of there, I went when I went to San Francisco. I was uh, living and working in San Francisco, but I, I would attend the art institute there. I never really formally attended. I would show up. I never could figure out how to uh, make a living and uh, and uh, and they go to school at the same time. So I was always working in my studio, and I had a sign business back then that I would be producing signs and uh, supporting myself. And I would, you know, I'd go to all the galleries and. Uh, attend the Art Institute, but I never really went to any formal uh, school or had any formal training at that point. How did you go, how did you get to New York? What happened? What <laughs> led you to, why did, wait, let me back up. The whole time you were in San Francisco, up until you were 28 or 30 or so, you right. were an artist and not a dealer, not a proprietor of a... No, absolutely not. I was working as an artist, uh, developing my work, uh, rented a studio, and... Uh, like everybody, just trying to, living on rice and beans, trying to figure out how to, uh, the best next step and hope, uh, hope somebody, somebody would discover me at that time. But uh, I spent a few years there working hard. I met a few good people that were living in LA and uh, convinced me to move down there. And I moved down to LA and I located there with, uh, uh, you know, a few dollars and just uh, found a studio, built my studio out. And I was working there, and I was uh, developing my work, started showing with a gallery called Fiona Whitney Gallery. And uh, and they joined with Fight Tursk, who was a gallery that was in Zurich and uh, Switzerland. And so I was showing in Switzerland and in uh, L.A. at the time with my about work. What, about what year are we talking about? This was the uh, uh, mid-'80s, late-'80s. Okay. I mean, in the late 80s, I moved to New York in 89, so uh, there was a period there where things fell apart. In 87, my studio was hit with an earthquake at, in L.A., and I had to uh, relocate. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And ended up in living in uh, the island of Zilt for a year in uh, Germany, working on a show in Switzerland um, uh, before I came back and packed everything up and moved to L.A., but, I mean, moved to New York. But uh, when I was in L.A., I was... I was, I was, I was, I was. Sorry. <laughs> a little bit of feedback. Okay, go ahead. But uh, anyway, when I 
came back from Europe and I uh, came back to LA, I realized that I needed to, to move to New York uh, because the you know, Whitney Gallery had closed and I, it was just sort of a perfect opportunity for me because everything was in storage and I needed that uh, break and I uh, went off to New York in 89 and then ended up here in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And you were an artist full time in Brooklyn when you arrived in 89. Okay. Again, I did the same thing. I showed up with a uh, little saved money that I had and uh, found a studio, developed a studio space again, and uh, started uh, approaching businesses to, you know, to make some money on sign painting because it was always my way to, to pay for everything was uh, sign writing, sign painting. But in New York, it was really fortunate for me because I ran into uh, a few people that were working with artists at Post Tech. And with Lawrence Wiener and uh, Lothar Baumgart. And uh, that that time they were, and they still are working and selling at the uh, Marion Goodman Gallery and also Leo Castelli Gallery. So I was uh, asked to help install their work because they were using text. And um, so I brought my uh, work, my talents there, and uh, uh, started helping them to install their work. And Lothar took a liking to what I was doing at my. Uh, work ethic and uh, I started traveling with him actually, doing shows with him um, throughout Europe and uh, in South America. And, um, it was frustrating for me in a, a funny way because my paintings did not have text in them as they do now at that time. And <clears throat> I was uh, you know, working with these artists and meeting great dealers uh, but it was all with my sign business. It was all with my my day job. Right. <laughs> so my artwork was languishing back in my studio, not not doing anything. And it was really um, an, a, a dealer, Jack Tilton, who uh, in New York sort of prodded me to do uh, text work. He you know, knew that I did sign work and helped all these other uh, major artists with their text installations. And uh, he kept prodding me, wanting me to do this. And uh, Bruce Pearson at one time had a group show and uh, invited me to be in the show. And it, it was a perfect opportunity for me to, to try out a text piece. And I I really did it for uh, Jack Hilton in mind. So that all the text read, uh, what's it to you, Jack? You don't know Jack. Uh, hit the road, Jack. All these idioms that I wanted to play off of that idea of uh, doing text and working uh, you know, in context with uh, Jack Hilton. I'm going to pull up an image while you keep going. Go ahead. So I uh, I did this to sort of prove him wrong, but after I hung the piece, he uh, he really proved me wrong. I really fell in love with the idea of doing this text and working with appropriate language. Um, and uh, as time went on, I kept developing this idea and started working uh, with mylars and overlapping text and this density of text. And um, a few of them are flashing up here, I guess, now on the screen. Yeah. So, I, you know, at that time, all I was doing was uh, working with these, these great artists and uh, working on my artwork. And um, it was about, oh, about uh, five years living in uh, Brooklyn that I realized uh, the frustration of trying to show the work because of all of the... Uh, there were so many galleries, but there was so much activity in a certain way, but it was, the economy was very similar to it is, as it is now. It was very sort of, you know, a bit depressed and um, hard to sell work, and artists were kind of doing a lot of interesting things, but I really couldn't get my work shown in a gallery that I would uh, wanted to uh, get involved with. And um, so I really wanted, I started this whole do-it-yourself kind of approach. I started my own gallery space which was more of a uh, glorified studio visit idea. It was an idea where I'd open up my own studio and hang artists work on the weekends uh, just to bring the artists in because Williamsburg at that time was really developing as a, as a community of artists and uh, a way to just uh, have a, a dialogue and create some activity and dynamic uh, in the art world on my own terms in a way, just to create a situation that was really intriguing and interesting outside of just sending out Sending out slides at that time, you just send out slides and you send out your packets, you know. Um, so it started work, working out really well, and uh, 
I also started the flat files at that time, a few uh, months into that, where artists could bring in their work, and uh, it was a great way to artists to befriend other artists and look at other work. And um, it was about 20 artists at that time. Let's explain that a little bit more. <clears throat> you, you, you took, and somebody said you're a little bit hard to hear. Maybe if you were a little closer to your computer or a little louder. Um, so you had flat files in the gallery, and flat files are like uh, architectural drawers for blueprints and holding works on paper. Um, and so you would have flat files that people, did they have to be juried? Did you vet them to see whether they could put their stuff in the drawers, or was it just, how did it start? Well, it really started with um, neighborhood artists that wanted to get involved, and I was really happy that they were getting involved. And uh, the first show I had in the flat files was that, at four walls with with uh, Mike Ballou's Mike Ballou space and uh, so can you hear me now? I'm just trying to talk about it. Again. Yeah, I think it's all right. Thank uh, you. So I started with about 20 artists and they were James Sienna and uh, Amy Silman, Fred Tomaselli, uh, Roxy Payne, all these big name artists that are doing well now. But it was a group of artists that were living in the neighborhood. We were all friends and uh, developed this idea of showing the work and. As I started showing the work, more and more artists wanted to be a part of the, fi the files. At that time, the works were only $200 and less, the idea that uh, it was affordable work and people and, and artists could get involved in either trading work or buying other, each other's uh, work. Um, and now today we have maybe 850 to plus artists in the files, and each file has maybe uh, eight to 10 artworks in them, original artworks. So it has really expanded, but back in those days, it was really a way, uh, like the gallery, to develop a uh, dialogue with other artists to create a sort of momentum uh, that uh, was interesting to participate in it was, and just to mimic or sort of reflect the idea of the, the neighborhood, the community that was growing at the time. Did you, when, I don't, you didn't do this to be a gallery per se, though, did you? I never really started it with the idea of being a gallerist. Um, when did you realize you were one? <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is uh, when I started the, the gallery or the, the space, it was called Kirogi 2000 because the neighborhood was very Polish and Ukrainian, and uh, and uh, it was sort of reflecting the neighborhood in that sense and address. And 2000 was a millennia that was never coming, it seemed. Uh, and even in 94, when I started, it seemed like it would never come. So it was sort of a cavalier sort of title because we were in Brooklyn and uh, doing off-the-cuff stuff. And um, so we called it Pierogi 2000. Uh, and uh, I started it with just the idea in mind of having artists come in and put up shows and to have a dialogue and, and without the intention of selling work or representing work. But as soon as I really started, we started getting a lot of uh, critical attention. New York Times was doing with uh, David Chair, I think, had his first uh, show and first New York Times review at that time. And uh, we put together also a wonderful show of uh, Robert Smithson's work, uh, which got an international critical uh, curatorial award. Uh, so we were getting a lot of attention suddenly as a space uh, to show work. And we started selling work a little at a time. I wasn't really pushing that, but as time went on, I would sell work, and I was working uh, during the day trying to paint signs and work for other artists to make a living. Then I had to cross over, but I was, the, the gallery was uh, pushing me for time, you know, trying to, I needed to be there more often to, to, uh, to make things happen and uh, deal with all the uh, interactions of the day. So I had, had to transition out of working and looking at the gallery where the gallery would start paying for itself. So that was a hard transition, but we finally got that working. And then I started, I still didn't represent any, any artists at that time. It was just about uh, a show space. And uh, as time went on, we were doing more and more work with the artists uh, and realized that we were doing as much as any other gallery was doing, really, in representation and promoting the work. So we started asking the artists if they wanted to be represented. and uh, as time went on, now we're up to uh, we have maybe 27 different artists that we represent. Yes, I, I, I don't know if I still consider myself a dealer, but I guess I am. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Um, 
how did you learn about how galleries function? Well, uh, that was a learning curve that I had to. Uh, it was well, galleries really function by uh, relationships with the artist, uh, which are like any other relationship. It's about trust and understanding and dialogue and working out uh, situations and uh, uh, ideas and working with uh, uh, curators and collectors is the same way. It's presenting the work and talking about it and uh, it's just a function of the gallery itself, the business of the gallery and uh, uh, the business dealings and bookkeeping and all that. That was the hard part. But it was the uh, function of the gallery <laughs> Is different in every gallery, I think. It has uh, their own personality and the uh, way they do things. And uh, we uh, fit into that construct somehow by just being who we were. Did you ever work for another gallery? Were you ever an assistant in another facility? No, I never, never did any of that. <laughs> so it was, so that's why I think we do a little, uh, do things a little differently here. We try, we, we have shows every month, like unlike uh, like every other gallery, I should say, and uh, have a uh, system of uh, monthly shows and work with art fairs now and do things that are consistent with other galleries, but are, are uh, viewing of other of artists' work or with the flat files and looking at work is different than in in, uh, in that context with other galleries um, and uh, just. The dialogue that we have, you know, being an artist, I I do have more uh, empathy, I think, for their situation and how uh, life works on both sides. So I can appreciate that, and uh, so I think with the shows we do and the uh, the alternative type of shows we do, I think we run a little different than most galleries. And being Williamsburg too it allows us to do things a differently. What do you mean by alternative shows? Well, um, well, you know, we're having our 20-year anniversary show coming up. That's a crazy reality right there. But yep. the uh, alternative show with that is that we're going to have uh, in the boiler, which is our second space that we have nearby, which is a more of a warehouse type space. We're going to have a Pinewood Derby race where we have maybe 300 artists uh, enter. Uh, and they all build a Pinewood uh, car, a derby car, and we race off to see who's the best artist, basically. How big and, are the cars? Uh, yeah, for the cars, yeah, we race to see who wins. <laughs> How big are they? Uh, they're about six inches long, and they have four wheels. There's the, those are the kits you buy at any uh, Cub Scout store. Yep. And uh, Gary Bachman came up with this idea back, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. We've been doing it every five years for... Uh, uh, our anniversary show, and unfortunately Gary passed away a year and a half ago, and uh, so we're going to dedicate this race to him. But it's really a fun race where everybody can get involved, and we have people entered for speed, uh, speed racing, and have some people race, enter it. We have an aesthetic award, uh, the speed award. We have a heavyweight division where people enter things that are uh, completely, completely not following the rules. I mean, the rules are supposed to be five ounces and under, but of course, when you're dealing with artists, they're they do everything and anything. Uh, so there's awards for the heavyweight division, and we have a What Were You Thinking award as well. So there's four different uh, categories, and uh, we have a blast doing this, and it's a big exhibition, and um, and it, uh, it's, uh, it's very interactive, very performative. And, uh, so that's an idea of a different type of uh, show that we do. And, uh, you know, and then also uh, the summer show we had was the uh, a salon show of the flat files with 250 artists in the files, and that covered a whole lot of ground. And then we show a lot of the artists that are uh, involved in in the gallery every month, and um, so we, you know, we try and do different things that like that and, and involve getting the artists involved and get people involved that uh, feel like they're uh, alienated or left out of this context. And that's an interesting thing you just slipped in there at the end. Um, how how does who feel alienated? What do we do about it? What how did this get to be an interest, etc.? Well, again, it comes back to uh, having a bit of empathy with with an artist's situation. Um, 
I try and balance this as much as I can with running a gallery. Gallery does lead, uh, pull me along. Sometimes I am pulled and sometimes I can actually lead a little bit. Uh, but when I can, I uh, try and get artists involved, especially with the flat files where artists, uh, you know, in a city like New York or Chicago or big cities where you feel uh, uh, one of many that you, you don't have a voice, you can't get involved. Uh, it's frustrating that you can't have a, that voice, and I think the, the files are a way to uh, have your work available to people and have it online and uh, have it associated with a gallery that uh, has some sort of credibility and uh, and can promote the work in a, in a way that you might not be able to. What what mediums are in the flat files by percentage? I mean, like, what, what's is it mostly drawings or mostly prints? Well, it's all flat work, of course, but it's uh, so that uh, includes uh, drawings, uh, work on paper, collage, um, uh, some uh, dimensional work. We have some boxes that people put things in, and uh, but it's primarily all flat. And eight, uh, 22 by 30 is the largest size. Um, unfortunately, we can't. Uh, show a lot of different works beyond that, but uh, it does reference, uh, cross over a lot of disciplines when you show up on paper. A lot of sculptors will work on paper, a lot of painters, uh, and then photography, a lot of different uh, disciplines can work at, a, at certain stages on paper. So we do, do represent have, a lot of very collective group of work. Do you have to have an employee just to handle people looking through the flat tiles? Well, it, you know, little by little, we've uh, worked it down. We've honed it down to a very sort of easy system, but uh, it, it does require a constant maintenance physically with the wear and tear on the folders and things like that. And now with the Internet, up, you know, uploading all this information constantly. So we do have interns that come in and help out a lot. We have uh, two employees, my wife and I, and uh, any help we can get. Yeah. But we seem to get it done. Is there a relationship between being in your flat files and being represented ultimately later on by the gallery, or are they totally unrelated? It's totally related. I mean, now, uh, I mean, I have a full stable of artists, but I do have an opportunity to look at work that I would never see otherwise. It's a, it's a studio visit in a way where artists bring the work to me, but I would not have the uh, time or the ability to, to go to all these studios and you know, artists like Don Clements and uh, you know Dan Zeller and uh, Mark Lombardi and uh, these artists, uh, John O'Connor came to me with through the flat files, and I you know would have uh, not been able to see their work probably uh, on just a studio visit alone. So it just the files uh, allowed us to create some sort of a friendship and a dialogue. You know, prior to actually going to the studio visit. How many, you said you represent approximately 28 artists now? Yeah. And how, how, how many artists have you taken on in the last year or two? Uh, we've taken on two, um, Andrew Ohanessian and uh, Mark Reynolds. Um, there are others I'd love to take on, but I can't really, you know, we do work with other artists. Um, uh, more than uh, others, and uh, but I can't really take on that commitment of representation. Because representation really allows uh, or asks of you to, uh, you know, do a lot of work, uh, sending out information, talking to uh, curators, uh, promoting the work, and having shows in the gallery, and uh, bringing work to art fairs and things like that. But it's a big commitment to represent the work, but I try and work with other artists that. Um, um, when I can. Is there any category between unrepresented and represented? I mean, are there artists, I mean, it, 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 you know, flat files aside, are there artists that you will show that you don't represent? Yeah, we just had a show of Larry Crone, who's an amazing artist uh, and performer as well, that we shown, uh, gave a one person show to two months ago. Uh, we've, we're showing, uh, Sarahman Cardis doing sort of a Turkish artist uh, coming up probably in uh, June and 
she's not represented by the gallery. Uh, Ken Weathersby, different artist, uh, uh, Deborah Zlotsky has been a very interesting painter we've been showing um, and uh, putting in shows. Um, so, yes, I do do focus on a lot of artists that I don't represent. Do what? How did you? How far ahead do you plan exhibits? Well, it's you know sometimes things fall through and uh, you have to uh, you know just pull something together. But primarily, mostly it's maybe about six to month to a year at least to uh, give an artist uh, a date for a show. Uh, you need to give an artist some time to develop the work. Uh, you, you need to go to studio visits to see if they're ready for a show and then talk about a show and and work the, the details out. Uh, I mean, six months is a short period of time. A year is probably about right. Um, is Do you think about, I've shown three women in a row, I need to show a man. I've, shown, I've done two group shows in a row. I need a one-person show. Um, I've shown two old people. Now I need a young person. Are you balancing these things or not? Well, it's, it's always a, it's always in the back of your head. You really you have a group show and you go, well, uh, you know, we have three women and two guys. Uh, that sounds about right. And uh, if it's the tall guys, you kind of think it's uh, it's a little uh, off balance. You need to have a different voice, depending on what the work's about, primarily. But uh, uh, it. I do think about that. I mean, it isn't always on the front, front and center, but uh, you think about it after the show is coming together. What's, what's, who's involved, and uh, who else has a voice that's that's not being uh, represented? I do a lot of group shows. The last two shows have been group shows. Uh, one was Idiom One and Idiom Two, and this, this show that's up now is based on uh, information-based work. It's more of a linear context, more of a flow charts like Mark Lombardi and the awards. Shelley and uh, William Powell and, uh, and Beth Campbell and uh, artists like that. Of the artists that you've taken on in the past year or so, were they all in the flat files or just some? Well, just uh, like Andrew Onesian right now is an artist that uh, does these very ambitious installation type of work. And there's no way that he does. He'll do sketches and things, but they're not really flat file material. So I really worked with him because of what I've seen and uh, the interest in his work. Uh, so he was an interesting case. There are other, uh, other artists that um, I've seen that weren't really first and foremost for the files, but they they do work on paper and uh, ha you know are involved in the files. But um, just trying to think of any other artists. There's a lot of performance artists, installation-based artists that could never really participate in the files. So. Are you comfortable? I mean, I think a fair amount of the work you show approaches or is difficult. And by difficult, I mean it doesn't. It isn't the kind of normal picture that goes over the couch that is somewhat <laughs> easy to sell. Well, if you were here to, uh, on Friday, we have an opening of Ward Shelley, and he has uh, he does beautiful work on paper, but he's doing an installation on, on Friday where uh, he and his partner uh, are doing an installation at the boiler where they're, they're on a huge, uh, like a Ferris wheel that they built in the boiler. It's a 20-foot diameter wheel with furniture that's all placed on the outside and inside of the piece with a built-in kitchen and bathroom, and they're gonna turn on this Ferris wheel with, uh, and live on it for nine days. And then this performance, it's just about living and how you do this circular sort of day-to-day -day routine, of working, sleeping, eating. And um, it's gonna be a wonderful installation, but of course that's not a sellable object. It would be wonderful if you do and take it on as a, an installation, but it's, having the boiler allows us to do the, <laughs> big crazy projects and it's, it's, a, it's about four tons of uh, material hung from the ceiling uh, but maybe we'll have it up hopefully up on the web if you're not in New York to see it you can see it on the web. Who's paying for the materials? The artists are paying for the materials and the galleries are paying for the rent and the up, keeping it open and uh, materials or uh, lists and things like that machinery to 
to make it happen. And uh, uh, when Andrew Onesian did his installation, he built an entire house in the boiler, which was a uh, huge expense. The gallery put out some money for those expenses, but it did go way over budget because he built an entire house in the space. Um, so, you know, we've done, you know, fluxus type installations with um, sound. We did the music for 100 carpenters where uh, 100 carpenters were in the space in groups of 10 and where it's a choreographed sound piece where they were hammering on nails in the choreographed sound installation. So that lasted for about 30 minutes and halfway through it, they all opened up their lunch boxes and bit into apples at the same time. <laughs> So it was, it was a wonderful sound piece, and then we did you know, Jonathan Shipper's um, car uh, collision piece, where two uh, muscle cars were colliding for over a month uh, with hydraulic power uh, uh, being pushed together uh, over one month period until they were crushed together. Things like that were so the boiler gives us a lot of ability and possibilities of doing things that are wonderful art installations but aren't really sellable, but uh, Aspects of them are with photography and some sketches and things like that. So I'm going to put up a picture of Jonathan's piece. How, I mean, this piece of Jonathan's you ultimately sold though, right? Yeah, there was, this was done in an edition of three. Um, we sold two and it's been touring quite often in different locations through Europe and, uh, it will be, uh, it's installed right now actually in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, you can you can turn this uh, the gears down so it will it can take four days to collide or it can take a year to to collide. So it's a very slow motion uh, head-on collision that is developed between in, using these two muscle cars. So it's called the slow inevitable death of American muscle. So it's about that uh, context in general. I remember. I think this was a wonderful piece, but. How often, how much does the saleability of an exhibit play into your desire to have the exhibit? Well, it really helps to be naive about some things sometimes. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> we, when we go into these things, we really are going into it uh, out of just pure uh, sort of interest and uh, desire to get it done. And uh, the costs sometimes are secondary. I mean, it's always the back of your head, but uh, the costs do come into focus. Uh, while you're doing it, but some of them are, some of it's mostly about uh, just help and getting help and people do volunteer and uh, and the amount of work that goes into it is always, uh, is often the, uh, a lot of time. So it's primarily just, a, you know, hours of labor put into it. There are a lot of costs involved. Uh, uh, materially, depending on the installation, but uh, those are sometimes we ask collectors to uh, invest some money into it. We've uh, had Tony Fitzpatrick's play that was at the boiler, uh, Patients Lost, which was wonderful. We had a collector uh, invest some money into that to help that production. So we do ask uh, people that might be involved to help out sometimes that way. Um, with the boiler, are there times when it's not being used? Or is it yeah, always well, something going on? No, we it's it's hard to program it. You know, we have a gallery and we have our two you know, our staff and Susan and I and interns. It's physically hard to run it uh, all the time. So we, I mean, during the winter especially, we close because it's too cold to operate it to heat it. In the August we close uh, just that's the season. You know, everyone closes right. in August. And then during this the year, we uh, we try and keep it open as much as we can. I do offer that offer to other galleries. I uh, offered it to like Mass Mocha or different institutions that might want to uh, have an ins installation that would be uh, something that they couldn't do uh, at their location or have something uh, near New York to do something or artists in another gallery that might have. Uh, big ambitions and need a bigger ambitious space to do it in that the gallery doesn't have. Um, so I, I do offer that out uh, every once in a while, but the gallery, you know, we, it's hard to develop a, a program in both spaces with our staff, but we do our best and we seem to fill it out uh, pretty well. I mean, this year is full. Uh, this, this coming year, uh, show is with Ward Shelley and 
And then we have uh, actually a group in Pratt. We have a, a, a graduate class there having a show for two weeks. And then we're going to have a, a seven group, seven different gallery show there, and a group of seven during the pre-show, and then go off and do a big video installation by David Brody. So that'll take up the whole uh, spring and uh, and summer there. And uh, then the fall, we have other things planned as well. How do artists get on your radar? Well, these days it's so different. I mean, it's primarily getting involved in the Internet, I guess. I mean, unless you live, um, I mean, we do have, uh, you know, social media, you know, with the gallery. I don't really do all Twitter and all that stuff. I don't, I, I'm on the email primarily just because that's what we do. We send a lot of information out and images and things like that. Uh, and I do Instagram every once in a while. You can get, you know, involved in that, I guess. But uh, the best thing is just to go to the site and follow what we're doing on the site. You need for the artist. Yeah, but an artist wants to get involved. If an artist wants to get involved in the flat files, you can uh, email the gallery and ask, uh, or just say you're interested in being involved in the flat files. And that, uh, you, uh, so we, what we would do is then just send you a link that has all the information that you have to fill out and send us in, in the order that we like to see it, and then we can take a look and uh, arrange for a meeting or talk to you about the work. Hey, if you guys have some questions, now would be a good time. We've been going for about 35, 40 minutes. Um, if you would like to raise your hands, I will call on you momentarily. I would like some questions. Um, <clears throat> When people put work in the flat files, are you are you paying? Are you covering the insurance? We have insurance here at the gallery. Yes. I mean, that's we a big expense. I'm calculating. You've got you must have a million dollars in there. At least, yeah. And we have a million dollar uh, insurance bill. <laughs> it's 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 you know we have insurance for the gallery. We do have a, 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 a we do. A, state on the insurance form that we might not be able to cover it fully and that uh, we'll do our best, but uh, we do have insurance for the gallery. I mean, over the years, we haven't had any problem, and uh, there's been a few slight things over the years, uh, but uh, people are always worried sometimes when the, if how people handle the work, but, uh, you know, we're not a, a shoe store or something. We're a gallery where people come in, I have a sensibility of what they're coming in to see. And they do treat the work with respect, and uh, we're there too to uh, some oversight of the situation. Cool, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Joe, this has been great. I, I love looking at your site and seeing the crazy things you do. I keep thinking about those two cars that are crashing together in slow motion. I think it's it's magic. Thanks. This is. Um, it's a hard question for me to formulate, but I'm, I'm going to try. So much of what uh, we see, what we hear as artists trying to learn about marketing, it's all pretty straightforward stuff, and it, it kind of feels a bit like um, like that that idea of you know make your make your painting so it can fit over somebody's couch and and market it and make the same thing year in year out and that kind of thing. And and yet what I see you doing is what I always think about is what real art and what real artists are doing and, and, you know, doing stuff that's crazy, doing stuff that stretches things, pulling a block of ice from the Arctic and, you know, having solar powered panels, keep it frozen for a month or something. I mean, this is, this is great stuff. I mean, do you feel like you're really way out there or is, or is there, are there a lot of people doing this? I just feel like it's, it's harder and harder to find galleries and galleries and, and, and even artists that are, that are willing to take these risks anymore. Well, risk is a big issue. I mean, a lot of galleries, um, the overheads are are very high, so they the risk that they put out is very low because they need to make the overhead. I mean, living in Williamsburg, where we we have the opportunity, we have a lower overhead, we have the opportunity to show things that are riskier because it's we don't really worry as much about that bill, I guess. I mean, I mean that's a practical sense of it. But, uh, you know, we want to, uh, you know, it, 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 come, it goes back to the fact that uh, uh, 
you know, I, I'm an artist myself. I really want to portray the art, the gallery as a place that really develops art and shows art in a way that is practical and impractical. It's, a, it's all about ideas. Um, the thing about the, the, th the thing that really uh, bothers me about the art world in a greater sense is that it, 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 it seems like a very class oriented situation. Mm -hmm. People think, seem to think you have to have a lot of money uh, to be a collector and, uh, and you have to be uh, from a certain class to collect work. And, it, it, and I think it's a big, it's, it's the wrong way to approach it. And the, the files are a way to get people to, to get involved in collecting work. Um, I think everyone should be collecting work. Artists should be collecting work. Uh, everyone should have that opportunity, but the way things are, it seems very uh, limiting for people. People feel um, isolated from contemporary work. And uh, it's not uh, a compromise to buy a, a piece of artwork for three, four hundred dollars. It's just very hard to find, and the flat files are a way to uh, have that availability for a lot of people. Uh, there are reasons why things are very expensive. Uh, because of demand and the quality of the work and uh, the history behind the work. But uh, there's a lot of reasons to get involved in collecting and a lot of reasons to show work and there's a lot of reasons to be involved in making art and showing art. So um, I were really you like ever, to keep an interest in Joe, were you ever uh, down in the East Village in the mid-80s? There, there was a place down there called the Emerging Collector. Which which reminds me of some of what you're talking about with the flat files, where people came in, put put slides in, they would have an auction every month. Does this does this ring in a bell? It it was a, a really great way to buy work that was hundred to three hundred dollars. Uh -huh. I well, I came to New York uh, in the mid '80s, and they finally moved here in '89. But uh, I don't recall that. But uh, that was happening then, and I just missed out on on seeing that. It's 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 very valuable and I think very rare because what you're really doing is helping create a new class of collectors. Well, I just think everyone's chasing the money and uh, I just think the door should be more open and and, and people should feel more uh, compelled or interested. If they are interested, the door should be wider that they can come in. You know, it just, it just seems so tight and uh, it should be more open for everybody. And uh, so we try and do that here, and the, you know, we do that in the gallery itself. So we show we show work that's uh, can be much more expensive, but the files are a way, a great way to get involved in uh, collecting if you haven't started or you want to try it out, or if you're a savvy collector to come in and find new work, or if you're a curator to come in and uh, fill out a show that has a lot of name artists, but other artists that you haven't heard of that might be involved or should be involved. Don't you feel, Joe, that taking risk is pragmatic? <laughs> well, I guess it just comes with the territory, so I think it is practical. I mean, it should be. I mean, uh, uh, you have to take risks to have any credibility to yourself and for the the critical world out there. I mean, you have to take chances. To be I so. and, and, and Bob, to be clear, I'm not recommending that people make pictures that fit above couches. I'm recommending that you, um, you know, be oh, oh, it's not. Yeah, that's not coming from you. I'm think I get something from Xanadu every week, and I, I'm 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 getting really sick of it. Uh, no, no, I don't. I'm not hearing that from you. Don't don't get me wrong. Jorge has different ideas than I do. Um, cool. All right. Hey, Bob, uh, Joe. Somebody asked a question about framing. If you're including a fair amount of work from the flat files, how do you present paper art during exhibits? Do you frame it, or what do you? How do you put it on the wall? And if more people have questions, I want to see some more hands. You guys, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Well, framing is always an issue because it's a cost issue primarily, and when you frame ten things, it's a lot of money. Uh, but yes. When we uh, we do have in-house framing here, and uh, uh, Justin, who does a lot of the framing for us, uh, uh, is busy most of the time doing a lot of framing, primarily for the shows we have. When we do the big salon shows with the flat files, we do pin the work to the walls. And uh, we do it in a way that doesn't disturb the work at all. But we do uh, present the work flat on the wall with pins. 
we mix it up. We have there's some frame things, but framing is a, is a big issue, especially with paperwork and getting the right work, UV and all the right materials, uh, paddle materials, and uh, so we offer that to clients when they buy work. But um, uh, you know, painting is easier in that sense. Um, but um, it's one of those drawbacks that you have to deal with. Does it enter your thinking about? Oops, we have too many paper. I don't want to frame any more stuff. <laughs> well, when we start, first started the gallery, believe me, most of the shows were unframed, pinned on the wall. But uh, since we do uh, in-house framing now, most of the work that if we do have time, sometimes work comes in last minute. We don't have time to frame it. But uh, we we do pretty good uh, with framing everything that's in the show. Wow, cool. All right, Bert, go ahead, Bert. If, if you're able to work on your own work at all and how much exhibiting you can do, how this has affected your personal work, being so involved in the gallery. Well, it's that's the uh, the issue is always time. It's fighting the fighting the clock, you know. So it's um, I try and work when I have a deadline of some sort. I try and work early in the morning and uh, late at night. Um, so if I can put a few hours in in the morning, early morning, and a few hours at night, if I could put four hours in a day, that's a good day for me. And that's a real good day. Many days I have no time whatsoever, uh, and I rely quite often on just uh, people asking me to be in, just show, in shows or one-person shows come up. I really have to plan ahead. So it's it's planning and uh, and being pretty uh, efficient with time, I do live in the same building where the gallery is, so I don't have a big commute. So if that's 20 minutes there, I can spend in the studio, not commuting. <laughs> are you making art? Are you making art when you don't have a show on the horizon? I do. Yeah, I have a studio that I'm always uh, working, and uh, my work, as you've seen, is uh, is more conceptually driven and uh, process oriented, and uh, that has Change my work has changed because I used to do much more uh, uh, abstract uh, process painting works, and uh, where I would have to contemplate the work in the studio, and I don't have time to do that anymore. So I, the way I work now, I can actually work uh, while I'm driving, thinking. I could um, stop and have a cup of coffee and think about it. Once the ideas are put together, I can uh, work efficiently for 20 minutes or three hours or and stop and start. I don't have. I can work with a lot of breaks in my time. So the work has changed over time because of my schedule. So. Aren't you known more as a gallery than as an artist at this point? Um, probably. I it depends on who you talk to, I guess. But um, I'm very grateful when I am involved in this show, and uh, and when I do show up at the opening, I feel. Uh, I don't know if I feel awkward or not, but I wonder which side of the fence I'm on. <laughs> but uh, I do enjoy having the shows and being involved in shows greatly, and I continue to work for that reason. Do you show your own work at all? I don't show my work. No, I can't. Uh, I can't do that. It's, it's more of a vanity issue. If uh, my work is shown at all, it has to be sort of uh, vetted somehow with other. People have to be involved. I can't rely on the quality of the work that I'm showing and, and put my work in uh, in that mix. It just it would be a vanity thing for me, and I just I don't think it's proper to show your own work in the gallery that you represent. Do you, do you use your relationship with galleries as an artist to try and get your own artists into that gallery? Well, I use my reputation as a dealer to get the artists in the other galleries. I mean, I yeah, but you can't others. separate them, so it's all a ball of wax, and it all contributes. Yeah, whatever works, you know. Yeah, whatever creates the dialogue or the conversation uh, is wonderful, and uh, in in that sense, I don't really separate the two. You know, people always ask me if how you can do both, and it. Um, in some ways they're different, but in a lot of ways they're the same. You know, I'm not a, a brain surgeon by day and a, an artist by night. You know, it's, it's it's all the same sort of thinking and conversation and 
decisions and um, and uh, but there's just a lot more people involved. That's all. Okay, Sherry, go ahead. Oh, hi. I I don't know if I missed this, but um, can you tell? So, what is the boiler compared to pierogi? Is the boiler like a big warehouse? It's separate or? Well, the gallery of pierogi, you know, has been here for 20 years now, and uh, it is your, I guess, your basic white cube format. It has a lot of white walls and clean space. Uh, and uh, we opened up a gallery in 2008 in the, in the Leipzig, Germany, uh, and it was in the Bambol Spinnerei, which was really a wonderful location. We were asked to go there, and they had these beautiful kind of warehouse spaces that we showed in. And then we're there for three years developing work and, art and uh, showing artists' works. And that became too much of a burden for us, the chipping and uh, and uh, just the costs were getting too high. So we wanted to refocus in Brooklyn and I wanted to find another space like that. So it was an adjunct space to the gallery that was a space that was very ambitious type of a space where ambitious Ideas that uh, you really can't do in a in a in a gallery white cube space. So the boiler is much more of an industrial type of space. It has a clean aspect of it with some clean walls, but it has a very rough uh, open warehouse type space that is very uh, usable for many different things. I mean, uh, performance and sound work, uh, art installations, painting installations, and the things that you really, you know, for our own sake, my wife and I doing shows every month for 20 years, it's, it's nice to have a space that you can do, you can stretch yourself and have, do it for the sake of the art, you know, it's really interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, did your wife make art? Uh, Susan's a writer and a poet. She, uh, did start uh, ten, or two, maybe ten years ago, I guess. Uh, Progi Press, uh, which is a journal of uh, of uh, writers and poets and uh, prose, and, uh, and we did put our work in there as well from the flat file. So we would augment the two together, and, and uh, it was just a wonderful journal that we did. Uh, I think eleven issues, and time got a little tight, and uh, I think it was. The crunch of 2008 that slowed us down a bit, and we're going to start it up again. This is going to start Progi Press up and uh, start more with an online version. I print every year, I think, uh, something like that. But we're trying to get Progi Press up again, and she's in charge of that. And it's more of her focus in writing and uh, and, and poetry and, and poetry. I have the feeling that your opinion about participating in art fairs has changed. Has it? Well, it changed from what? I mean, I was, well, I guess, I mean, as a young gallery, I was always excited to be part of a bigger context, I guess, and Ferris had that ring to it, and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I, you know, it was a much a different context back then. Ferris weren't such a primary sort of focus for collectors and, uh, and interests as they are now, and it fairs have become a an obligation in a way that draws a lot of attention away from programming at the gallery. I mean, a lot of galleries do quite a number of fairs, and it, uh, I don't know how they you can. It's hard to balance your your program at the gallery with these fairs. It's, it's a very distracting context in a way. It's very expensive. Um, you know, sometimes you meet. Your expenses, and sometimes you lose money, and uh, it's it's very it adds a stress to your your life. Uh, that is, isn't that great? And uh, for <laughs> for everybody, and also it's I don't know if it's great for the artists because the artists, I mean, there's there sales involved and all that, and everyone uh, can do well. And uh, the fairs usually are written about as the fair and, and as the gallery, and some artists are. are Singled out, and um, but if you're an artist and you want to critique or have a review of your work, you usually have to show it at a gallery or a museum context. And um, a lot of these fairs are drawing a lot of work out of artist studios, and they have 
uh, a chance to put a proper show together because all the dealers are always pulling work out or asking for work to be fed. Um, it's, it's created a, a, a real demand that, and stress on the galleries and the artists. Um, it's great for the collectors, I guess, because it allows uh, viewing in a single moment of a lot of different things, but I don't know if it's the best way, in my mind, of seeing is you, you're so satiated by information. Uh, and the, and the presentations only allow for the biggest and brightest things usually, and um, if you're doing nuanced work or performance work, installation work, you do somewhat left behind in these fair contexts. So there's a lot of good about fairs, and there's a lot of bad that I, I see. And um, uh, sometimes I wish they were more biennial, sort of related, or, or the, the pace was a little less stressful. Um, so um, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's things that are growing all the time. There's fairs everywhere, there's biennials everywhere. So uh, uh, as long as the galleries can survive these uh, this context. Uh, which I think it's very important for the artist to have a, a viewing platform uh, where you can focus your work better. Uh, as long as the galleries can survive this, um, this barrage of uh, art fair activity, I think it'll work. But it, it has been a, has put a lot of stress on the on the whole framework. Yeah, and the people that have to go and sit at them and be there. Yeah, it's a big obligation on the viewer. It's a, it's a big, it's a big. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They're, they're big and uh, bombastic kind of things. I'm not sure exactly how they're going to live or survive, but I, we're in the middle of them now, and we're just seeing how how we're going to ride through it. Cool. I'm not a big. I'm, you know, I guess I'm saying I'm not a big fan of the art there, but as an artist, I mean, I know, I know a lot of artists that don't go to them because they just hate. To see their work presented in such a, a modified sort of venue, and uh, and the work um, is you know is somewhat cheapened that way in a, in a lot of ways. It's yeah. I, I mean, I think it's changed how people look, and I think it's changed you know how art is made. Um, and the sure. demise of a, a the gallery show and the attendance and the people at the gallery and the the energy that happens in an exhibit is diluted by that. Um, and yeah, now, I don't know any dealers that really love art fairs, and we all think they're going away, but they seem to be, but they they continue to come. Yeah, I always hate when success depends on sales. You know, the success in a lot of artists uh, are, is based on just reviews and critical acclaim, and uh, many times that doesn't equate to monetary sort of ends. And, uh, Art fairs primarily equate to how much money you make. It's frustrating. <laughs> I hear you. All right, Joe, I think we're, we're, we're done. I think you've shared a lot of really valuable information and shared insights and shown your warmth and, you know, distinguish yourself from other galleries. And I think you're doing, I think you're doing wonderful stuff. And I think, you know, I mean, I, I think for the artist here, Joe's worth paying attention to. You know, in part because maybe he's interested in your work, but also in, because he's doing an exemplary job of running, you know, how a gallery should operate and how a gallery can genuinely care about their artists. So it's kind of like a touchstone, something you can compare as you, you know, consider the relationships you do have or the relationships you will enter. You know, you can compare it to the way Joe does business and hopefully have someone who's as empathic as he is. Joe, let me unmute everybody so we can all say thank you in unison. And I've done that. You're all unmuted, gang. Joe, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right.